Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest in our series of ENO Center for Transportation webinars. Today we are going to be discussing automated vehicles and safety with Dr. Mark Rosekind. Uh, Dr. Rosekind is currently the Chief Safety Innovation Officer at Zooks, where he leads efforts to safely develop, test, and deploy automated vehicles. Uh, he also brings a unique perspective to the field of AV safety with his background in academia, at NHTSA, at the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, as well as his forays in private industry. He has over 30 years of experience applying his scientific expertise to transportation safety, uh, including specializations and international recognition and awards in areas of human factors and fatigue management. Uh, while at NHTSA, Dr. Rosekind was responsible for the first ever federal automated vehicle policy, which has since been updated twice and we are going to briefly go over some of the current guidance and regulation for AV safety. And then I will turn the conversation over to Dr. Rosekind and we will go through some of your questions as listeners. Um, just as a reminder, you can enter questions in the question box on the side of your screen at any time. Uh, and we will go through as many as possible after the presentation and discussion. So just a little bit of background, uh, one of the reasons that we are working towards putting automated vehicles on the road uh, is the potential safety benefits. Um, we have a public health crisis and traffic deaths. In 2017, uh, over 37,000 people died in traffic deaths. Um, NHTSA estimates that 94% of these crashes were caused by human error. As a transportation engineer, I always like to point out at that point that uh, even crashes that might have been um, environmental or due to uh, roadway conditions uh, are also human error because we as humans are able to assess those conditions and designs. Um, but in terms of how we're defining impaired driving, et cetera, uh, these are issues that people think AVs could really push ahead and help with some of those safety issues. Um, it's also important to remember as we talk about safety in automated vehicles, um, we've got different levels of automation between uh, the SAE levels, you know, one through two and three, and then highly automated vehicles also, um, levels three, four, and five. And so you get different safety benefits with different types of technologies and different uh, levels of automations. We have automated driving systems we uh, already on the road that are likely and have been shown to provide safety benefits already, uh, not to mention ones in highly automated vehicles that are forthcoming. Um, another factor to remember to take into account when we talk about safety outcomes, uh, there's ways to look at those safety outcomes, but then also looking at risk on the roadways. So in terms of total deaths or the uh, number of uh, traffic incidents, uh, we need to be thinking about safety and exposure. Uh, so if we are increasing the vehicle miles traveled, then we are increasing exposure. And even if the safety outcomes end up uh, moving in a positive direction, these are two elements that you need to think of when you're looking at risk overall in terms of roadway risk. So the Automated Vehicle Policy 3.0 just came out. Uh, it really focuses on this multi-agency approach. Um, and so even outside of DOT, uh, you have the National Transportation Safety Board, who's in charge of investigating crashes. Uh, and the Tempe crash that Uber was involved in earlier this year is a good example of somewhere that NTSB stepped in and is looking at the causes of that and what safety implications we can learn from incidents. Um, it's important to remember also that they don't actually have regulatory enforcement power, and that's where DOT comes in. Uh, so the AV 3.0 document outlined the roles of different agencies looking at this multimodal approach. Um, NHTSA is obviously one of the more relevant agencies. Uh, they're the ones setting the safety performance standards. Um, they're the ones allowing exemptions, uh, putting in definitions, and setting recommendations and guidance. Um, beyond that, the uh, Federal Motor Carrier um, FMCSA oversees and coordinates with states and localities. So looking at what's the federal role, what's the state role, and how do we get the coordination that we need 
um, and preemption where it should be and where it shouldn't be, et cetera. Um, Federal Highways is set to update, update the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices soon. Uh, the last one came out in 2009, and so DOT wants to make sure that in the next version of the MUTCD, we do see attention paid to automated vehicles and safety and standards around those. Um, and that is a legal document, so whatever FHWA puts into the MUTCD is going to be a national standard that people have to abide by. Uh, on the transit front, um, FTA has put out a guidance on um, AVs and transit, uh, and they are also tasked with technical assistance for public transit. Um, and then moving on to rail um, and maritime, um, you see a lot of focus on the uh, multimodal safety research and doing studies um, looking at things such as at-grade crossings for rail um, and that kind of thing. So one of the things that I uh, pulled out of 3.0 that I think is a very relevant to this conversation is the voluntary safety self-assessment. Um, this is interesting in the guidance. 3.0 highly encourages um, manufacturers to do a voluntary safety self-assessment. The purpose of this is that it's a public education document. Um, the manufacturers are outlining what safety elements their vehicles have and how they're paying attention to that. Uh, one thing that this is less of is a, a quantitative assessment. Uh, it's more of a description, um, but it's definitely a first step. And as long as we're going with a voluntary and a working document um, moving into the future, working off of those voluntary safety assessments and making sure we have the public transparency and communication uh, is gonna be important for making sure that everybody's on board and that we're able to roll out these safety benefits with the public acceptance behind them. So that's just a little bit of background as to where we are coming from. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Mark Rosekind and he's gonna talk a little bit about his experiences and his perspectives. Um, and just as a reminder, again, you can enter your questions at any time, and we will also go through those at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Alice. I'm just going to make a few points, and then actually let's open this up and see if we can address some questions that people might have. So just a, a few things. One is I really love that this was focused on AVs and safety because that's the context, if not sort of the rationale that so many people use for why we have to pursue automated vehicles. Um, and I think the place to start actually is in a much larger context, which is for 100 years in auto safety, uh, really the approach has always been reactive. You wait till somebody um, is in a crash, they get hurt or they die, and then you react to that. And hence a lot of the stuff that we've had has been reactive kinds of crash worthiness to make sure people survive things. I think the real excitement is while we've seen so much progress, um, vehicles getting safer, so much better things on the road, um, we've seen the numbers come down, but, you know, 37,133, which is like two jumbo jets crashing every week for an entire year. And if that happened in aviation, we would literally, after the second crash, we'd be closing the national airspace. And yet we allow an entire year of that kind of loss of life. And so the excitement really is about moving from a reactive safety approach to more of a proactive because truly the ultimate of proactive safety is preventing crashes from happening in the first place. That's what all these automated technologies offer. And it's very straightforward. If 94% of crashes are due to human choices or errors that we make, um, whether that's, you know, attentional and distraction or uh, drunk driving or drugs or being too sleepy, um, you know, all of those things, the reality is there's our first target. If we could just get rid of those 94% of crashes, literally that's like 5.9 million crashes out of the 6.3 that happened. You know, there's a target for us to start with. And I say that because one of the things people need to realize, this is not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, the technology is moving very fast. But even if you had the perfect technology suite to eliminate all roadway deaths, it would still take 15 or 20 years to actually penetrate the entire fleet of 265 million vehicles that are out there on our roads, with 17 million new ones being bought every year. And so I think, you know, we really need to realize this is a huge societal transformation, going from being reactive to proactive, where we really want to prevent crashes in the first place. 
And just the second thing I just wanted to highlight is um, during my tenure at NHTSA, and, and I keep pushing this too, is um, people commit this from so many different points of view. You know, we need to regulate this. We need to make it voluntary, et cetera. The model I've really thought about in my head is we're in the moment where innovation is critical. I mean, nobody knows what the answer is to all of these things that have to be addressed now. We need the innovation. It has to be driven by safety, absolutely, because that's what our endpoint is. But we need innovation and eventually to be driving data-driven best practices. And then finally, those data-driven best practices can actually underlie and be the foundation for good regulation in the future. Um, so I say that because people are always talking about what's the balance here. And I think that's what the path should be. And we're just at the very first, very beginning, basically, of that innovation part. And we just have to make sure that the innovation gets done within a large window of really significant focused safety concerns to make sure that this development really is going to allow us to realize really the best safety we should go for. I'm one who absolutely believes this technology could get us to zero deaths on a roadway. We can't ignore that the new technologies are going to introduce new mechanisms where people could be in crashes, et cetera. We have to understand those. But this is really the most significant tool in 100 years for us to apply it to safety. Um, and I think that's a balance we have to keep in mind, that we shouldn't be allowing 100 every day, and we need to think about everything we can do to stop those tragedies. And just my last thing I'll mention, which I think you highlighted, is it's been fascinating personally for me because um, it's just very rare to come from, you know, science to the NTSB um, to NHTSA and it provide and now being literally in the room with engineers trying to solve some very hard problems. It's just been fascinating to see that um, on one hand, some of what we're trying to do is straightforward with the safety issues. And yet at the same time, frankly, it's also a big challenge, both from engineering and trying to create new safety metrics, for example, that we're going to use to know we're really on the path to try to reach those zero lives lost on our roadways. Anyway, with that as context, what, whatever you'd like to talk about, Alice. Great. Um, why don't we start maybe with uh, one of the points you made towards the end there that we need to figure out um, what metrics we're going to use. You mentioned the target, setting a target of eliminating that whole 94% of crashes that are based on human factors. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how – how exactly you think we are going to get there, at what rate, and how we can measure that as we move along to make sure that we're on the right track. Sure, and that was about three questions in there, but let's take the, the context of what you're trying to get to there. And, and that is, and I think it's really important now as you focus on something, you know, people love to throw those stats out, the number of lives lost with the 94%. But let's go to what your question, the heart of it is, since being administrator, I used to go everywhere and say, what are the new metrics going to be? You know, how are we going to measure how well we're doing on our path to try to get to zero? And, you know, we need new ways to measure this stuff. So I think to your question, just very concretely, let's just start with the 94%. You know, one of the things that um, developers and manufacturers could do would be to literally analyze how their sensor suites and AI and, you know, the, the technology that they're developing can actually address, if not eliminate, those 94%. So what's interesting is that 94% comes from a NHTSA paper that we published. Um, you know, great folks did some wonderful work at NHTSA in 2015. Uh, they kept saying, oh, we're over 90%. I said, give me the number. And the reason I say that is most people have actually never read the paper. And it actually goes in to the multiple categories of how that 94% actually falls out. So some's on yeah. attention, some's on the human performance side. Yeah, so there's a place to start, for example is, you know, can anyone who's working on this technology actually look at that list and map how their technology, how their sensor suite, how their AI, how their algorithms will actually address all those elements that make up that 94%. There's a place for you to go. Can they actually demonstrate that they could get to 80%, get all 94% of those human factors, human element part? Um, and that would be a great metric just to start with to demonstrate that you're addressing what is the largest bar in the lives we're losing. Great. Um, mo moving back into this idea of uh, innovation while maintaining the guidance and regulation that we need in the public sector, can you talk a little bit about how you find the right balance 
uh, between setting government oversight and leaving room for innovation. That's something that people are constantly talking about in the context of, of AVs and where where we need to draw that line. Yeah, one of my famous lines, and I, I got to write this down sometime, but um, I, I'm from Silicon Valley. And so, you know, one of my favorite lines is, you know, when your app crashes, nobody dies. Mm -hmm. And so there's you know, there's a pretty significant transition we have to make with all this technology now to realize, you know, it's, it's life and death on the line now. You know, it's people's safety uh, and their family and their friends and communities, et cetera. Um, and so I think, again, core to your question there is, you know, when you talk about safety innovation, safety has got to be on the front part. It's got to be a foundational value, a core value of what you're doing to approach the innovation. Um, and I think in many ways it can be straightforward um, and what's critical here is that people don't just talk about that it's a priority because priorities change, um, but that you can literally highlight, you know, we're addressing problem X, and here are the safety elements that we're going to put at the very top that we are going to hold literally focused on throughout our development of addressing whatever X is. And you should be able to state what that objective is from a safety perspective at the beginning. You can innovate whatever you want in the middle there, whatever development and other things you want to look at, but you should be able to track how you have ensured that safety is the core value of what's working through all of that. So whether that's code or AI or algorithms that you're doing or buffer zones or your safety drivers, whenever you're looking at what the innovation is, you should always be starting with what the safety margins and what that envelope is to help you move that innovation forward. And let's not forget, there's plenty of ways to innovate in simulation, on test tracks, et cetera, that don't necessarily put people at risk. Um, and I think that's another thing we need to see, which people don't talk about it a lot, but you know, before anybody gets to public road kinds of testing, simul you know, there's all kinds of work within you know, coding, et cetera, the simulation that should be done, private road, private test tracks, et cetera, before you ever get to public roadway. So again, show where the safety is, and then innovate you know, as much as you want in all the areas that don't put people at risk, and then make sure that envelope is absolutely the right cushion if you're going to move that into public arenas. In looking at the private sector developing this technology, how do you think we can both motivate them to, to make sure that safety is the top priority um, and also hold them accountable for that and, and check in and make sure that they're keeping safety as a top priority? Yeah, and I, I think this is the place where uh, and, and just been my experience generally at NHTSA and, you know, getting around in the industry now is that, you know, responsible companies want to do this safely. Um, and I think one of the ways that, you know, all the developers, manufacturers, et cetera, can help that along, help safety along is transparency. And so as much as there's sometimes been some talk about, you know, do we need voluntary this or that, the reality is that shouldn't even be an issue. You know, companies that are responsibly developing this technology should want to be transparent about how they're addressing safety and communicate that not just to the public, but to the regulators, potential riders, um, you know, as far and wide as you can about how much safety is a core value of what they're doing and how they're literally tactically addressing that. Um, and so I think, you know, that's one of the things is good responsible companies are not going to see that as a threat, as a demand. It should be the opposite, which is this is our way to make sure people understand how safety is being promoted because that's our end message there. Um, so, I, again, I think, you know, what's interesting is as much as people have tried to make noise about, uh, like when the 1.0 came out, um, you know, there was a, an assessment letter that was there with 15 categories, and, and at the time it wasn't required, and part of that was just because there wasn't time to get the Paperwork Reduction Act, you know, all done. Um, and so everyone's looked at the voluntary part, but the reality is responsible companies should be taking this on to really demonstrate through transparency, data, et cetera, how they're ensuring safety is going to move all of this forward. Great. Uh, there's a couple questions that have come in around cybersecurity. Um, can you talk a little bit about plans either or preferably both in the public and private sector to tackle the issues behind cybersecurity? Um, that has to do with more regulations, uh, what you have to do from a developer side, um, and then maybe a little bit also about the liability behind that. Sure. 
and you know that what's interesting about the cybersecurity part is you can, there's a lot of areas here where we can pull from other industries. So I often talk about, for example, how aviation, which went nine years with no fatalities in commercial aviation, you know, we need to take whatever lessons learned from that environment and proactive safety cultures and apply it to wherever we can with, you know, to road safety, for example. The same is true in cyber. I think you have to give the auto industry a lot of credit and it's a push um, and to, you know, help them really participate with their whole community to create an auto ISAC information sharing and analysis center. Um, and an auto ISAC exists. Um, it basically pulls in all the best practices that are available. And that's not just industry, but it's military and, and a broad uh, group of different approaches to this. Uh, it serves as a center where if something comes up, it can actually, you know, have different organizations calling in, sharing that information. Um, so that's just one, just one example of how, you know, the industry along with government and others can get together and actually address things like cybersecurity. And it ends up, ISACs are already available in all kinds of other areas. They're in banking and infrastructure, um, military uses similar kinds of things. And so, you know, again, these are models that already exist. We need to apply them here. The second thing I would just say is this is a great example of technologies moving so quickly. Uh, and I, I bring this up all the time when people always used to say, well, we got to regulate this stuff. And my first question was always, what are you going to regulate? Everything that I signed uh, into a regulation as administrator was in the pipeline for eight to 10 years. And, and I say that because in this realm, when you think of just cyber, you know, that if you were to put any regulation in, in eight to 10 years, even five years, whatever you put into regulation would be so outdated, it would actually create more risk for you. And so I think cyber is a great example where you need to innovate. You need to pull models that already exist. And starting in version 1.0, um, all the way up through the current stuff, there are all kinds of, you know, pointers to where things already exist within cyber that need to be pulled in to address cyber within AVs. Um, and that's, again, a, an example, I think, of where you want to use all the best practices that are already proven by data to be effective. And where's the innovation where you can add even more? Uh, and I say that because, uh, for example, it's going to be totally different if you have a fleet of robots that are doing, you know, robo-taxi kinds of things that you might own and control as opposed to somebody who might sell you an automated vehicle that's in your um, garage. Because just the physical access makes a difference about what its cybersecurity vulnerability is. So cyber is a great example where we need a lot of innovation, but we should also be applying all the models and experience we have from every other place to harden our uh, defenses for that issue. Mm -hmm. And then from from the perspective of cybersecurity, but also the physical roadway safety, a couple of people have been asking, uh, where do we draw that line in terms of uh, how safe is the vehicle? How much testing do we have to do before we can allow them on public roads? Um, and then also, what fleet um, penetration amount do you think we need to really start seeing those safety benefits that you talked about? And these are such great questions because I, I think, you know, one of the classic ones everyone loves to ask is, so how safe is safe enough? That's kind of what this boils down to. And, you know, one of the things, again, I love to ask people is, so how safe is safe enough for the current system? Because basically, and this is a, a NASA technical term, but, you know, it sucks. The 37,133 people dying in the current system. You know, um, yes, we have federal motor vehicle safety standards. We have, you know, state laws and things that help with everything. But, you know, the system, we're losing too many lives, too many people getting hurt, just crashes happening. Um, and I say that because I think it's a very hard question to answer. I think we need to address it. It's also one of those places where besides going after the 94% metric we discussed, this is another one. I would really challenge uh, developers and companies to come up with their own internal targets of what they want to do. Um, there was someone recently, an academic, who said, gee, if we could just get you know, the AV system 10% better. Um, there was somebody who actually found, uh, I, I was usually really good about never saying anything or, or putting a stake in the ground, but somebody found a comment as administrator where I said, well, let's start with two times safer. Um, and the reality is, I don't think we know where that number is. And I think it's a place where, again, developers and, and manufacturers and industry should be identifying, here's how safe we believe we should get, and then measure it and demonstrate that's how good they could be. 
And that's why I say, let's start with the 94%. If a, a company comes out and says, look, we can get to 90% of, you know, we can get to 90 of that 94%. Great. Then let's go figure out how they're doing that and then measure it to make sure once they're on the road, we're really there. Cause that's, let me just finish this part by saying one of the challenges we have here um, is of course, that none of this stuff is actually on the road. So sort of the second part mm-hmm. of that question is, um, you know, how do we know how much penetration? So what's interesting is, you know, I mentioned the regulation earlier, but the Office of Management and Budget really doesn't even review a potential regulation until there's typically a minimum of a 10 or 15 percent penetration of the fleet, because that's the minimum you need just to get sort of the cost benefit analysis at a point where they can analyze it effectively. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things to think about. And it's a great question. There's no answer to that. But even from the cost benefit side, if you're not at somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, there's no way to evaluate really where the benefits are going to be. So, again, a great question. You know, as much as people are concerned about seeing these on the road, it would be horrendous if we did all this stuff and never tested them on the road, you know, on on real public places. So until we actually have done all we can until they're available on public roads, um, we need them on public roads at some point actually measuring how well we're doing. But I think that starts with people setting their, you know, setting their target to see how well they get. And that's where the transparency is great. We'll know a company that says, yeah, I can nail 94%. And someone else says, well, I can maybe get you 50. That's the kind of stuff as a public and as consumers we need to know about. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. It would be nice to have those numbers coming out sooner rather than later also, definitely. Um, there's a couple questions coming in about planning uh, for people versus planning for vehicles. Um, discussing, you know, at one point we invented jaywalking to make sure that we had pedestrians staying out of the way of vehicles. Um, there's a lot of conversation about uh, connected technologies in the context of automated vehicles and what happens to uh, people who are walking or people on bicycles. Um, when we're rolling out those connective technologies and uh, how how do we need to be making sure that all road users are being accounted for in these safety safety planning and safety evaluation? Yeah, and, and that is so critical because I think so much when people talk about the safety of AVs, they're thinking just about the vehicle part. And the reality, you know, where the numbers are going up higher is in, you know, pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists, et cetera, the vulnerable road users who are out there. And really, we got to be looking for the safety of everybody. I mean, when you think of, you know, a road to zero, zero means nobody on our roadways, whether you're in a vehicle or walking, et cetera. And whether you use vehicles or not, we're all pedestrians at one point or another. And we've really got to protect everybody. Um, And so I think, you know, that's where whether it's at 94% or anything else, you can't just be talking about protecting people in the vehicle. You really have to be talking about the safety about the entire roadway. And that's why just the the thing I'll mention very quickly is that's where autonomous vehicles need to operate on their own, be independent. But there's also an increased margin that's going to be available by having things connected. So whether that's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to pedestrians, V to X, or the infrastructure, V to I, um, getting those connected and having ways to be able to communicate. I always point out that vehicle to vehicle literally would let an autonomous vehicle see around corners or across, you know, an intersection. And so I think, um, you know, whatever we can do to start maximizing that kind of communication is going to help all road users to be safer in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, there's a couple questions coming in. Uh, about the uh, FMVSS um, and the fact that we're still working on developing those uh, and looking at test standards. Um, how do you see us moving forward with that and what timeline uh, do you predict and do you recommend? Sure, and I think uh, just two quick things about that. One is it's a big challenge for the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards the way they are, because they never envisioned not having a driver, a steering wheel, et cetera. And I always remind people that even if you go to change the FMVSS, that's still a regulatory process. And so, you know, again, that's uh, potentially eight to 10 years, five years of changing many of those things. So one of the things I just want to highlight, um, Matt Buse is Associate Administrator at NHTSA, 
um, you know, one of the ideas we came up when we wrote 1.0 is just like there is a, quote, semi-new um, category for electric vehicles, that one of the ways moving forward, if you're going to do a regulatory process, is create a new category for AVs. So rather than going and just changing piecemeal all the historical, again, being reactive, think about being more proactive and maybe creating a new FMBSS that focuses more specifically on AV. And I think you know, your questioners, they've got it right. The challenge is going to be how do we balance this innovation and the progress with the existing regulatory structures, which just have rules. You know, they're just, they're rules. They're in place by law of how long those things take. Um, and so we got to figure out how to work within the current structure, but also maybe create new ones, like say a new FMBSS for AVs that would allow us to really look forward um, and be future looking about saving these lives as opposed to just staying in a reactive mode. All right, great. Well, I love hearing uh all of the positivity around the safety benefits moving forward, and hopefully we are getting there soon. There's a lot of issues, obviously, that we still need to work out uh, as we innovate and move forward, um, but there's a road to zero deaths, hopefully, right? <laughs> um, yes, as we absolutely. Great. Uh, as we move forward with these issues, Eno is going to continue uh, writing about and covering AV safety issues. Um, as a reminder, we will post this webinar and the slides up on our website, uh, enotrans.org. Um, we would like to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for all of your words of wisdom. Um, and a reminder to all of our listeners to keep an eye out for our webinar next month, where we're going to recap and analyze election outcomes for transportation-related ballot measures. That's going to be on Wednesday, November 7th. You can register online at our website, enotrans.org, um, where you can also subscribe to Eno Transportation Weekly. And thank you, everybody, again. Have a great afternoon.